Chapter 10 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zanusha The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb Chapter 10 Uncle Nodding Jenny, you may remember, had always pretended that the imaginary Uncle Nodding gave her toffee to eat when she went to see him. When she thought of Uncle Nodding, she was so used to putting her tongue in her cheek, pretending to be eating toffee, that she did it without thinking when she went into the room where the real Uncle Nodding was. A dear old man with mild blue eyes was Uncle Nodding, and he sat by the fire because of his rheumatics. Of course, to do the thing properly, the real Uncle Nodding ought to have brought out a real paper bag and offered her some real toffee. But he didn't do anything of the kind. So Jenny was obliged to go on pretending the toffee part. "'I've got some pictures here to show you, Missy dear.' he said. He was the only person who ever called Jenny Missy, and it made her feel rather nice and grown-uppish. They're round about my little shop. They was drawn by Albert Crust, my shop boy, a rare one with his pencil as Albert, or with anything else for the matter of that. You should see him weighing currants. I never knew any one make fewer currants go to a pound than Albert. And yet the weights are all right. I don't know how he does it. It's a gift. Shut the door, Missy dear, because of the draught. My rheumatics is a bit troublesome today. You didn't know I had a little shop, eh? But of course I have. Uncle Nodding's Little Shop I keep a little grocer's shop along the village street. My doorsteps worn and hollowed with the tread of many feet. And in and out, and in and out, the people come and go. And all day long I'm serving them, and running to and fro. I keep the choicest bacon, the best of tea and soap, and sugar and tobacco, and firewood, cheese and rope. And in and out, and in and out, the shop bells tinkle tink, goes thirty, forty times a day, or even more, I think. For all the village comes to me, and every one you'll meet, inside my little grocer's shop, along the village street. Albert Crust This is Albert Crust, by himself. He serves behind the counter, takes the orders round, and does anything and everything he ought and ought not to do. He's a rare help, that quick and that willing, almost too willing, as you might say, but he never gives over weight. He's sixteen come next April, but so small, I could put him in my pocket, in a manner of speaking. To see above the counter, he has to climb up and stand on top of an empty sugar box. And what for you, Sonny? Or, now then, my little dear, he will say, with his hands spread out on the counter, for all the world like my old grandfather used to do. But you should see the way he can throw a loaf of bread right up into the air and over the counter, right down slap into a customer's shopping bag. All the boys in our village would give their ears to be able to do it like that. And many of them have got a thrashing for trying to do it with a loaf of bread at home. The strange noises Albert can make with his mouth, too. All the children envy him. Besides imitating corks being pulled out of bottles and paper tearing, bees buzzing and dogs yelping, 
He would make queer croaks and gurgles, which used to make me laugh. I couldn't make heads nor tails of what he was driving at, as you might say, and many a laugh we've had together. But one day I found out it was supposed to be me he was imitating. I soon put a stop to it. No sauce, Albert, I says. No sauce now. Right you are, Governor, he says. And no sauce it was. And no sauce will Albert have from any boy or girl that comes into the shop, neither. And if they try it on, it's woe beside them. For Albert has got a little way that gives them such a fright. A little trick with his eyes. Makes them bulge out sudden-like when he's annoyed. And then there is no knowing what he will do. From whipping off his apron and smothering them with it to rattling down a whole pile of empty biscuit tins on top of them. Still, he is a good boy when he isn't roused, and a useful, and I wouldn't be without him. He never gives over weight. Here is a picture of the little boy who annoys Albert and me very much, because he always runs all his words together like this. A pound and a half a drip in a jar of jam. Albert sent him away with a bar of soap, but I don't think that is what he asked for. This is the little girl who came into the shop the other day and said to Albert, Half a pound of butter, please, and two pence change for mother. And have you got a paper bag to give my little brother? He says he wants to blow it out and make it go off pop. He always wants a bag to blow when we come out to shop. Sunday in the shop On Sundays, when my shop is shut, I sometimes step inside and stand and look about. Here's this little shop of mine, I think, belonging all to me, and I can't help feeling a bit. It seems queer to you, I expect, to think how anyone can feel for an old sloping counter, a pile of biscuit tins, a bacon cutter, and a shelf full of marmalade jars. Everything is very quiet and still. There's not a sound to be heard in the shop except, perhaps, the buzzing of a fly on the window pane. There's the old brown painted till, the drawers of spice and packets of tea, and the glass jar full of bull's eyes, and the noisy coffee grinder, quiet now and fast asleep. I look along the bottom of the counter, where the paint is worn and scratched away by kicking and tapping and fidgeting of feet. Through a chink in the shutters the sun is shining, and Albert, in a new bowler hat, puts his head round the parlour door to know if I am going for a walk, but I am not going out. I'd rather stay inside my shop and stand and look about. End of chapter 10